And we're getting you all caught up on another major trial that has gripped the headlines around the country. It involves a former state trooper named Daniel Howard, who's accused of shooting his wife to death. Now, they were estranged at the time of her death, but he's maintaining his innocence, claiming that his wife died by suicide. Now, his defense team wants to call the medical examiner who performed the autopsy, right? And this is becoming an interesting issue. If you missed our last hour, here's why it's key. So the medical examiner who did the autopsy on Kendi Howard provided the findings consistent with suicide. But prosecutors and investigators, detectives strongly disagree with that. They had another opinion uh, taken. They had another medical examiner in the same office review the autopsy and strongly disagreed that this was a homicide and that she was shot after she was strangled to death. And so the state didn't call that original medical examiner. But the defense plans to call him today, and this is something both sides have been arguing about in the courtroom. Let's go in and take a look at what happened on Wednesday. The state filed a motion to exclude Dr. John Howard. You would note that the state became aware that John Howard was going to be called as a witness during trial when Mr. Johnson issued a subpoena for him. Mr. Johnson, in his response to the state's motion, seems to indicate that the state was playing games with its witness list. And so I'd, I'd like to clarify that before we get into the reasons why Mr. John Howard should not testify. John Howard left the Spokane Medical Examiner's Office within months of Kenny Howard's autopsy. He canceled his medical license in the state of Idaho and he let it lapse in the state of Washington. Before he left, he communicated to coworkers that he was done. He did not want to do this job anymore. He didn't want to respond to subpoenas anymore. And he wanted to retire. And frankly, Judge, that's what he did. The state did not know where John Howard was. And so when the state's witness list, first, second, third, all said to be provided, that was because the state did not have contact information for John Howard. Now, if the state were playing games, as Mr. Johnson seems to be alleging, the state could have dropped John Howard from its witness list. But the state believes that there was a potential foundational factual need to keep John Howard on the witness list and engaged in ethical actions in attempting to locate John Howard. We got, some, got a tip that he moved to be closer to his grandkids, whether that was Idaho, Washington, Connecticut, or Georgia. The state didn't know. And there certainly are a lot of John Howards in the world. So the state did take efforts using its internal investigators to locate John Howard, get an address, and provide that. But what wasn't happening while the state was making those efforts is that Mr. Johnson was not complying with the basic principles of ICR-16. ICR-16 requires that expert witnesses, their reports, their curriculum vitaes, and the information used that they rely upon to create those reports be provided to the opposing party. Even more so, Your Honor, in this particular case, there were scheduling orders in place, not once but twice by this court, providing deadlines for the parties to provide that information to one another. At no point did the state provide to Mr. Johnson a CV for John Howard. At no point did the state indicate that it was going to call John Howard as an expert witness with a notice, as it typically does. John Howard was not called at the grand jury, and there was nothing in the record to indicate that the state was going to be utilizing him as an expert. In three years of this, the state has not reached out to him one time. It was not hiding, it didn't take long to find. It didn't take an active investigation. Um, so certainly the state was aware that we were calling him, both by our pleading and by our um, record, numerous records. And he's a necessary witness, and the state is at no surprise, Your Honor. And frankly, every single expert has relied on his opinion. He's a necessary witness to, to offer that opinion. 
So if, if you understood all of this, why didn't you list him as an expert witness? It seems like he's your number one expert witness. Why didn't you list him as an expert witness? We can provide his opinion to the state. So we, the state has his opinion. Well, has, have you talked to him since? I've confirmed that he, one, I got a hold of him, confirmed. I confirmed that uh, uh, he'd be willing to testify. I have not subpoenaed him. Uh, I wish I started to, but I have not subpoenaed him. Uh, he is going to be here tomorrow. Have you discussed uh, his opinion with him? I discussed his opinion with him. Um, I have not shared any other experts' reports. I have not talked to him about um, Dr. Morrow. I have not talked to him about Dr. Desmond. And you, you didn't think you had an obligation to tell the state what his opinion was going to be, pursuant to the scheduling order and the rules of discovery that require expert witness disclosure? His opinion is the autopsy report, Your Honor. I, I, I don't find uh, sufficient prejudice to the state that would permit the exclusion of what is possibly one of the defendant's most important witnesses, which is almost his only witness to contradict uh, the state's uh, medical witnesses. Um, I'm not saying he's going to successfully do that one way or the other, but the defendant has a right, a due process right, to present his defense and to exclude that, I think, would be uh, an abuse of discretion and and extremely harmful to the defendant's right to a fair trial, where I don't find the defendant himself had any role in this late disclosure. Um, in Idaho, one of the cases I reviewed, they, they approved you know, a monetary sanction on defense counsel to impress counsel with the importance of following the rules of procedure and discovery. And I may, I may, I may do that. I may impose a monetary sanction on defense counsel for not complying with discovery, but I'm gonna reserve my judgment on that for right for this moment. Um, but ultimately I, I I'm not going to exclude as the ultimate sanction uh, Dr. Howard. Oh, this is tough. The state's in quite a bind. And I'll tell you something else that's interesting. So you're hearing about Dr. John Howard, right? He is the medical examiner that did the autopsy on Kendi Howard. And he's the one that the state is saying uh, is very close to retirement, anxious to get out of the office, overlook some things that were very apparent, indicating that this was a homicide, not a suicide. He shares the same name as the defendant's father. So the defendant's father is also John Howard. There is no relation whatsoever, but this could get a little confusing today because they're both gonna be witnesses here. So we've got John Howard, the dad, and Dr. John Howard, the ME, both to be called today at noon Eastern time when this case picks up. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this. This can be tough when, when you're on a case and you are an advocate, you know, one of the lawyers you're serving as a prosecutor, or maybe you were the affiant, I mean, the police officer who signs their name uh, to uh, the affidavit of probable cause and the filing of the charges. When you disagree with one of your experts, it can be bad, it can be embarrassing. And uh, so let's talk a little bit more about that. I have a great guest on the show with me. Uh, he served in law enforcement for many years at the state level, at the federal level, uh, worked in corrections. Uh, he owns his own consulting firm now, Michael T. Wilhite Sr. on the show this morning. Uh, so Michael, I feel for these prosecutors, you know, I, I've been there and it's not easy to say, you know, ignore the person's findings who's paid by the county, you know, paid by your hard earned tax dollars to come to a medical opinion, discount his and listen to hers and oh, and listen to this other expert, although an excellent one, Dr. Smock is fantastic, but he doesn't work in that county. He's a, a hired gun, as we say. So um, talk to me a little bit about how uncomfortable that is if you're one of those detectives these detectives obviously believe strongly that this guy staged the scene he killed his wife uh, he was uh, someone that she was terrified of and they're saying no 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 we want a second opinion um, how would you be urging your advocate Michael to tackle that at trial I have to admit you're looking at the at the prosecution and a, an attorney's office and you're like this is amateur hour at the Apollo how on earth <laughs> did we get to this point? 
Uh, I love that you always tell it like and, and, it is, Michael Wilhite. You call and, it like you see it. And this and 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 and, and this is this is just crazy. I, I, I truly believe, first of all, how do you not be able to get in contact with one of your key, key witnesses, key, key, key testimonies? How do you not do that? And so when, so basically not being able to rely on, on the, uh, on the exam, on original examiner's uh, findings, whatever it is, whether he was, you know, checked out cause he's retiring or just, just checked in, but just inadequate, not doing his due diligence. Again, they should have dropped him like a hot potato and went on to another uh, examiners, have them do it and just, and, and, I, and I suspect I know what happened. In the midst of all this, he does exam, he does his examination, he finds his, what he's gonna find, and in the, midst, in the midst of all that, he retires. So now during retirement, he wants to be he wants to be paid as a consultant. <laughs> sure. Come back. That's, that's probably what happened. Right. Right. And, and the defense is that. willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And the defense is willing to do that, but the prosecution said no. You you know when you did all this, this you were a, a government employee. You know. Mm -hmm. But again, this just adds more weight, more doubt to the uh, to the uh, defense uh, that this probably was not. A, a, a homicide, although suspect it was, but the judge hit it, hit the nail right on the head. You know, there's an obligation that the defense do a discovery, and that he should. That the defense has an obligation to know what that uh, examiner's findings were, you know, and opinion were. So, it's it's a mess. It is a mess. But uh, they should have dropped him right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And brought and went with the another examiner. Mm -hmm. Right. The the um, the doctor, uh, I believe her last name was Nara, uh, who the forensic pathologist who testified excellent, uh, gave great testimony. It's just tough. It's really tough when you disagree with your experts' findings and you get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I can't blame this defense team. They are doing exactly what I would do if I was on the defense side. I would bring mm -hmm. that doctor mm -hmm. right in, make him look mm -hmm. great. Michael mm -hmm. Wilhelm, we're going to talk mm -hmm. all all about it today on the show. Stand by if you would kindly, my friend. We've got to hit our first show break. When we come back, we're going to hear from the defendant's father. Same name as that medical examiner, John Howard. He's talking about their visit the day before the fatal incident that's in question. The first parents in America to be charged in a mass school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter and four counts of it. The gun recovered from the shooter was the same gun that was purchased by his father. Jennifer was found guilty. Who is responsible for storing the gun? Now the school shooter's father is set to stand trial. My husband is. The school shooter dad trial. Live coverage today on Court TV. So grateful for your company on this Thursday morning. Welcome back to Court TV Live. So right now we're watching a really mysterious case play out in Idaho. It's grabbed national headlines and it began right as James Crumbly's trial was beginning. And so what we've done is, you know, we um, are filming this trial and kind of going backwards. It's still in progress today. You're going to see it live here today on Court TV in just a couple of hours. But in the meantime, uh, we're, we're going back and looking at the state's case and the defense case. This guy's the defendant. He's the a kind of disgraced state trooper I had to resign over a theft case and he's being accused of murdering his estranged wife uh, over some money assets that the two of them would have had to split around two million dollars if they divorced uh, so they were estranged but not divorced and she died the state says by being strangled to death the defense says by a gunshot wound that was self-inflicted. So now we've looked at the state's case, we're turning to the defense's case. And the first witness they called, the defendant's father, his name is John Howard. Take a look. When did he meet uh, Kendi? He met Kendi after he was uh, had gotten out of the Marine Corps and uh, uh, at that time, was working for the Idaho County Sheriff's Office. Do you know when they were married? I beg your pardon? Do you know when they were married? 
Yes, now it's been, I can't remember the exact date, but it's, it, now it's been uh, about 30 years ago. Okay. And when, after they were married, did they live in the Lewiston area? Did what? Did they live in the Lewiston area? They, uh, yes, he lived in, in uh, Idaho County, and then they moved to Lewiston when he went to work for the state. At some point, did they move up to Apple? That they did, and uh, he'd been employed by the state for, I can't remember exactly, uh, five or six years, four or five years. So, five year, from the five years prior to Kendi's passing, um, where was Dan working, to your knowledge? Uh, he had been working in North Dakota and Alaska and uh, uh, for four or five years. In your uh, understanding of Dan, how would you describe his normal demeanor? Objection relevance. It goes, it's foundational. Foundational of what, Judge? It's not relevant. Well, it's been, it's been addressed by the state uh, in their case, and so I'll allow, um, I'll allow this as a rule. So, Mr. Howard, when, how would you describe Dan's normal demeanor? His normal being or demeanor? Demeanor. Uh, usually he's very, very exacting and uh, uh, projects that he started complete them. Uh, pretty, pretty much family man. Around the end of 2020 and 21, uh, were you aware of a possible pending divorce between uh, Kendi and Dan? Yes. Okay. Was that, uh, were you aware of that prior to or after February 1st of 2021? Yes. Which one? Was it before or after? That was before, uh, a couple of days before. Um, did Dan come down to your place on February 1st, 2021? He did. Okay. Uh, why did he come down? He came down to visit. Uh, Dan and, and Brian Wilkins both came down to visit. Um, so Brian was with him? Yes. Can you describe, did they stay with you that night? The, what was that? Did they stay with you that night? Yes, they did. I had company, a, a friend of mine was, uh, I just brought another low guy still moving in. We're, so there's four of us there and they came down and, um, Uh, I was unloading and knit another load into my shop and into the hay barn and uh, when they showed up, so. What time do you think they showed up? That was in the afternoon about, uh, it was one or two o'clock in the afternoon, I think. Okay. Did uh, the four of you then have dinner together? Did he what? Did you have dinner together? Did he have? Did, did the four of you yes. have dinner together? Yes, we did. Okay. And did the four of you stay in that, in your house that night? Yes. We, we Can, barbecued steaks and, and uh, went to bed probably 10 or 10.30. Okay. Um, can you explain a little bit how your house is laid out? Yes, it's a, it's an older log home and, and uh, it's 
uh, about 2,800 square feet. The bottom floor is a large kitchen with an island, and then there's a large kitchen table, and then it uh, there's a stairway in the center of the house, located central in the center of the house, that goes upstairs. There's a walkway around that stairway that goes to the living room area and my office area. And there's uh, four bedrooms upstairs and uh, two couches and lounges downstairs in the living room. It's a large living room. And is your room one of the four rooms upstairs? Yes, my room is a master bedroom upstairs. It's just a little larger than the other three bedrooms. There's uh, double beds in all of the, there's double queen beds in the three spare bedrooms. Did, where did uh, the others sleep that night? Uh, Dan slept in the north west bedroom. Brian slept in the north east bedroom. Uh, Ken White had an old back injury, so he sleeps downstairs in a recliner it, uh, to fill, facilitate his breathing better. Okay. Now, do you have any animals that sleep with you? I do. I do. She doesn't sleep with me. I have a well-trained cow dog sleeps in a little dog bed that's next to the foot of my bed. As you can tell, I'm hearing impaired. I lost my hearing in combat, but I have that dog for a reason. She's trained. If she hears anything outside, she'll wake me up. She'll stand up on the side of the bed and grab my hand and let me know that there's something moving around. Okay. What time did, uh, did everyone go to bed at around the same time that night? It was around 10 or 10.30, and, and we all went up and went to bed, and the doors were, uh, uh, I leave my door open into a hallway. There's two bedrooms, there's a short hallway, two bedrooms on each end of the hallway. The hallway runs central, north and south, and uh, Brian was in the east side of the bedroom in the northeast, Dan was in the northwest. The doors were, uh, Dan's door was open, Brian's was closed, and um, all the lights, there's a night light in the hall. Okay. And so, um, to your knowledge, did Dan get up and Paced it all that night? No. The, uh, that dog would have been up and getting me up if that would have taken place. All right, what do you think of the first John Howard we're going to hear from, right? I told you this is the defendant's father, John Howard. First defense witness called, but they're going to call Dr. John Howard, no relation, the medical examiner who did the autopsy on Kendi Howard later today. I want to bring in my guest now. He's a retired DEA supervisor, special agent. He served in the Department of Corrections. He's done a work as a state trooper, has had an illustrious career. Michael T. Wilhite with us today. Uh, Michael, the allegation from the state is that Dan Howard was a disgraced trooper who staged the crime scene to make it look like his wife died by suicide, shooting her in the mouth after she already was strangled to death by him. He calls 911. Uh, Dad's the first witness called. Um, Dad wasn't there at the time, right? But he's kind of painting the picture. Uh, tell me what you think Dad is doing for the defense case, Michael. Oh, definitely. Dad is, is there to, and they're aware that his memory is kind of, you know, is not exact. He's an older gentleman. But Dad is basically there to put a softer tone to the defendant. He's there to to to, to relate to the to the jury or to the court that my son's a good guy, a good guy. He's he's uh he's you know, yeah, he's had some 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 bad deals in the past, but ordinarily 
he's a good guy, you know, dad, dad and, and look at the, listen to the tone that dad and the, uh, and the, is, is, is talking in, of course, older gentleman. Um, he's there just truly to humanize the defendant. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Michael. It's kind of like he's sort of a character witness. It's kind of like he's a way of getting around the rule against character witnesses. You know, you can't just call them in criminal cases. That's prohibited by the rules of evidence. But by mm -hmm. calling dad, making him a fact witness... Even though he doesn't have mm -hmm. much facts about the incident in question, it's helpful. Uh, great analysis, mm -hmm. as always, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to hit a break. When we come back, we're going to hear more from the defendant's father as he's describing learning about his daughter-in-law's death. Don't go away. Thanks for being with us on this Thursday morning. So we're on a verdict watch right now. You can see the jury deliberation clock ticking at the bottom of your screen. We're approaching the three-hour mark in the case against the Oxford school shooter's father, James Crumbly. So we'll let you know if we hear anything. The, the jury deliberations have been quiet so far. No questions. Our team is watching there. So we'll let you know if they have anything for us besides a verdict. In the meantime, we've got another case that we've been filming uh, and while the James Crumley case has been going on, uh, we're calling it the Jealous Ex-Trooper Trial. This one involves a mystery. Was it a murder or was it a suicide? So we're going to pick up with more from the defense's first witness. The defense is saying that Kendi Howard died, Howard rather, died by suicide. And they've called Dan Howard's father, John, to kind of provide some context. And here you're going to hear his reaction in learning about his daughter-in-law's death. How did you learn of Kendi's passing? By her phone. Who was the phone call from? Dan. Was anyone with you? Was anyone with me? Yes. Yes. We were <laughs> eating breakfast in that same restaurant when I got the phone call. Could you, uh, can you describe that process of what you did when you received that phone call? Yes. Relevance. In order to goes to its foundation to some other question. What he did after he got the phone call has nothing to do with this case. Jim. There's been an issue of who was contacted or not contacted brought up by the state. Well, well, maybe you could make it a little more specific rather than just can you describe the process of what you did when you received that phone call. Um, if you could direct the witness more specifically. Um, all out of question. What did you hear? What was said when you got that phone call? What was what? What was said when you got that phone call? Jason here. This is Did you understand what was going on when you got that phone call? I had a very hard time understanding the, the Dan because he was crying and bawling and finally. He squeezed out what had happened, and and I could barely understand it. So I got up from the table, went outside, and attempted okay, to call him close. back. Overruled. You went outside and what? I went outside and attempted to call him, call him back. Were you able to uh, get a hold of him again? Yes, but I couldn't understand him. Okay. He was uh, quite upset. Did, without telling me anything that your friend said, did your friend assist you in trying to understand uh, that phone call? Objection. Uh, it's going to be hearsay. It's also not relevant. Okay. Okay. Was someone else heard the phone call being explained to this witness? Well, the question was, did your friend assist you in trying to understand the phone call? That's a yes or no question, so over. Oh. Did someone assist you in, in understanding that phone call? Yes. Uh, my okay. friend, Ken White. Okay. After you understood that Kendi had passed, did you try to make contact with uh, Mr. Wilkins? Yes. 
after uh, that, did you travel up to Athol? Yes. What day? Uh, 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 I took care of things and I got to Athol at about uh, one, one o'clock or one thirty, I think, somewhere between one and two o'clock. And that was on the third of February. Yes. Did you see Dan? I did. When I can you describe his mannerism? Describe his what? His mannerism. He was very upset and. Uh, um, Why it was there. Okay. And so, first, there's hugging and crying. Is she actually not responsible? Well, I mean, overall, this is not your witness, so it's not your objection to make. Nonetheless, counsel, he can't just testify in the narrative. You know, so, all I have to ask the questions uh, of your witness. Later on, um, there was a, were you aware of a memorial down in Kamei for Kendi? Yes. Did you have any discussions with Dan about attending that memorial? I did. What did you tell Dan about that memorial? Objection here, sir. It's his statement, Your Honor. But it's an out of court statement offered for the truth and our service, and that's hearsay. What he told Dan? Correct. Okay. Was. Did you want Dan to attend the funeral? Objection, no. No. Overall. Why? Objection to relevance. The state's made an admission. I'm overruling the objection. There were, there were threats that were, that were rumored and Objection going on Facebook. Objection to the foundation of false or speculation. We're talking about rumors at this point, Judge. No. I, will, I will sustain that objection. Okay. So, um, You didn't want him to go? Objection leading. Overruled. I told Dan, don't go with it. It is not worth the confrontation. All right, just ahead, we've got the cross-examination for Dad. The state of Idaho asks about his son's short fuse. Don't go away. Ion kicks off the National Women's Soccer League starting March 16th. Brings you in, takes a shot, and she scores! Wow! Incredible! Yeah. Look, a new Saturday night destination featuring the best players in the world. She's on fire! I got my head in the game. Oh my goodness! This is a game changer for sports. The ground. See the full schedule and find where to watch at IonNWSL.com. Thanks for staying with us here on Court TV Live. We're getting you all caught up on the jealous ex-trooper murder trial. This one's happening in Idaho. Everything is going to resume live at noon Eastern time. The defense started up its case on Wednesday, calling the defendant's father as its first witness. So let's pick back up with now the cross-examination of dad, John Howard. You described your son's general demeanor as very exacting. Remember that? That what? That your son's general demeanor was very exacting. Do you remember that? Yes. In, in other words, he wanted things done his way, right? No, that's not necessarily so. Your son was very clear about how he wanted things done in life, right? No, that's not necessarily so. He's... Uh, 
he's just a forthright person that uh, doesn't act, that he didn't operate in a helter-skelter way. He, he, he planned ahead, didn't he? He what? He planned ahead when he wanted to accomplish something, didn't he? If, if he had a project, sometimes he would do that, yes. I, and, and he told us he would go through and finish those projects, wouldn't he? The what? He would finish the projects that he wanted to get done, wouldn't he? Well, yes, I didn't live there, but the few that I saw him uh, work on, like his, the boat or the projects with the animals on the place, he'd finish those. Once your son, your son had a goal in mind, he would see it through, right? I would expect that. He was that kind of man, right? Uh, like I said, I didn't live there. I didn't see it all the time. The few times that I visit, I was pleased to say the, see the shape the place was in. And, and he would go forward with a plan and put it into effect, even if he didn't really want to go through the details of that plan, but he would do it to get to the end result, Judge, wouldn't he? Calls for speculation on it. Over. So, he'd go through the details of the plan? He never did that with me, but... Okay. Your, your son had a, uh, uh, was quick to anger, wasn't he? He was what? He was quick to anger, right? I don't really know that. Well, he was your son for a very many years, correct? It is what? He was your son, he's your son, and he's been your son for many years, right? Yeah, he accomplished many things on his on his place. It was a nice place, and but your son is quick to anger, right? Quick at what? Quick to get angry. He's quick I, to lose his temper. No, I right? don't think that. I I never thought that. He he was quick to tell Kendi what to do and how to do it, right? I never witnessed that. You knew that Kenny wanted a divorce, right? Uh, Dan had told me that they were getting a divorce. Dan didn't want to get a divorce, did he? The, what? I don't know. I mean, when I heard about it, I was told that they had both agreed to it and were uh, making a list. Dan yeah, likes his money, doesn't he? What? Dan likes his money, doesn't he? I've never asked him about that. But you've known him quite some time, right? His normal what? You've known your son his entire life, right? No, I... Besides liking his money, Dan also likes his property, right? You're telling me how I view my son? I don't view him like that anyway. Does Dan like his material possessions? D does he like his what? Material possessions. I couldn't say that. Okay. Dan didn't want to lose half his possessions to Candy Diddy. Objection calls for speculation. If he knows. I that would be something I know nothing about. Okay. So in, in terms of hearing, you've told us that Dan can't hear out of one ear, right? He can't what? Hear out of one ear, right? That's correct. But he can hear out of the other ear? Yes. Okay, so you, you can talk to Dan and he can hear what you have to say, right? Yes. 
I, I'm usually make sure I'm close enough so we don't have a problem. He hears me quite well. And Dan can hear loud noises, right? I would think. Dan knows what the sound of a gunshot is like, right? I would think. And Dan can recognize the sound of a gunshot even though he doesn't have hearing in one ear, correct? Well, it, I guess that would depend how far away the gunshot is and how he's, which side is turned to it. So the closer the better, would that be accurate? It's what? The closer the shot was, the more he could hear it? It, it would be to me, the closer it was, the louder it would be. I think that's with anybody. All right, what do you think of Dad? How did he hold up on cross? Let me bring back in Michael T. Wilhite Sr. All right, Michael, what do you think of the cross and the responses? Dad did good on the, on, on the original uh, uh, questioning for the defense. He did even better on the cross, I think. I think he held up. Yeah. Why do you think you said that? Do you think, why do you think you say that, Michael? Because considering this oh, is an elderly man, the, the, and, the pro, and the prosecutor is basically using, trying to, you know, play on his words, uh, things like uh, his asking him if his son uh, completes all his tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, he he, he pre-plans things out. And what, he, what I suspect he's alluding to, of course, the murder, of course, you know. Right. But, uh, but also, if, if, if Dan, if the, if the, if the defendant, uh, knows the sound of a gunshot. Um, uh, whether or not he can, whether or not he's 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 a uh, um, a very his his demeanor is more exact. Uh, it's, it's his way of, or is his way is his way of the highway, mm -hmm. you know, so so to speak. Um, I, I think Dad held up, you know. Now, granted, right. I don't know if that was if that was just Dad or just. The age kicking in, but dad mm. held up. <laughs> he did, he did. Dad held up well. He he did a fine job. And we know there are gonna be more witnesses coming. This defense team is choosing to present what seems like is gonna be a pretty robust defense. So they're defending him on mm -hmm. innocence grounds here, as you know, Michael. Uh, to prove a, a mm -hmm. staging, uh, that's tricky, isn't it? To prove that a, a criminal defendant staged a crime scene. That is very tricky, and that shows uh, that, that that's that's pre-planned. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to uh, one of your prior, you know, my other colleague that it was that was on uh, before. Yeah, women keep their guns in their purses. That's one of the most common locations when women carry their guns. But to have your purse in your in in the bathroom while you're taking a bath, again, I say, I know women like to accessorize, but that that's that's going kind of I've never seen that. I'm with you. I I've think that's that weird too, Michael. I've heard that. To yeah. Have it. And and if and if you have it in there, that says that you're not trusting the the environment or the person that's in the room with you. Right. I agree with you. We got to leave it there for now, Michael T. Wilhite. You're the best. Thank you so much.